Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 are the verses that we're looking at. And we looked at verses 5 through 8 last Sunday. And this week, we're going to be focusing on verses 8 and 11 in, in particular. Or excuse me, uh, 5 through 8 last week, 9 through 11 this week. And so I'm going to read all of them, though, again, to remind us of the whole context. So if you're able to this morning, if you'd stand with me in honor of God as we read his word together. Philippians chapter 2, I'll begin here in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And we come to verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You may be seated. May God encourage us through the reading of his word this morning and his name be praised and glorified. And Father, we do uh, thank you this morning for uh, the men in our church, uh, young men and middle-aged men and older men. And uh, we pray that in your kindness, uh, you would grant us wisdom to understand your word, uh, to understand you, uh, to understand the times and our need uh, to act like men in these times. We pray that you would give us endurance uh, to be godly, to, to model godliness, uh, to model gentleness, to model reliance through faith, and your son, Jesus. We pray that in your kindness, you would help us to minister with joy and with uh, a commitment to servanthood. We recognize that this is impossible on our own strength. And so we ask that you would continue through the work of your spirit to help us to rely upon the, the strength that you supply us with. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, I appreciate uh, Brock, as he was praying this morning, mentioning the wonderful book of Philippians, and this has been a, a wonderful study, I think, for me. I hope it has been encouraging for you as well. The practice at Bethany, of course, is to preach through a, a book of the Bible, uh, typically just a, a paragraph or so, or so at a time. Uh, the book that I get asked to preach through more than any other book is the book of Revelation, uh, people are always like, hey, when are you going to preach through Revelation? When are you going to preach through Revelation? And I'm like, well, right before I retire. I think that's <laughs> the safest time to preach through the book. It'll hopefully be before then, but we'll, we'll see. But I think it's good that people are curious about the book of Revelation. They, they know that there's some things in the book of Revelation about the future, and, and people want to know about the future, again, which is good because God has told us some things about the future. But what's interesting is sometimes... The things that God has told us about the future are not necessarily the things that we think we want to know about the future. And the things that we think we want to know about the future are not necessarily the things that God decides to tell us. But the good news is that everything that God does desire us to know about the future, he has revealed to us. And, and the further good news is it's not just in the book of Revelation that we find out things about the future. It's in texts like the one we're considering this morning. There are things that God reveals to us about what's going to take place in the future and, and how we need to respond to that, to view it. Sometimes when people come and they think about the end times and what we call eschatology, uh, teaching about the end times, the word eschatos means end and ology study of, so eschatology, the study of end times. Sometimes when people think about eschatology, they think about, okay, well, I want to know who the Antichrist is, and I want to know what's going to happen in the Middle East. I want to know what's going to happen to America. And, and some of those things are, 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 are fine. All those things are fine things to wonder about, but those aren't the things to build our eschatology, our, our teaching about the end times. Those aren't the things to build our eschatology around. Those aren't the truths that serve as our foundation of our eschatology. I'm reading a, a, really, uh, a really interesting book, a book I'm really enjoying right now by John Piper called Come Lord Jesus, Meditations on the Second Coming of Christ. 
And the passage that he builds that book around is not a passage that you find in the book of Revelation. It's a passage from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, Paul says, There's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but listen to this, but also to all who have loved his appearing. For the believer, we love Jesus. And as we think about the end times, what we are excited about more than any other reality of what's going to happen in the future is that we are going to see Jesus. That Jesus is going to come. That's that's the foundation of our eschatology, of what we think about when we think about the future. You know, in 2 Timothy 4, Paul says, and to all who have loved his appearing in verse 8, and then he goes on, he says to Timothy, make every effort to come to me quickly. And then he says, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. So, in the space of three verses, you have Paul and all believers who love the appearing of Jesus, contrasted with Demas, who loves the present world, loves the present world, loves the appearing of Jesus. Now, why can those loves not coexist? Because whenever Jesus comes, that represents the end of all the the worldly loves. For Demas, the appearing of Jesus is is a tragic thing because all the things that he's built his life on are now gone. But for the believer, as as the world comes to an end in terms of the things that are are worldly and fleshly, all those those things come to an end, that's a time of great joy because the one in whom we have placed our trust is here. I think that's really helpful. I think that's really helpful for us as we think about the foundation for our thinking about the end times. Do we love the appearing of Jesus or do we love the world? Does Jesus' coming represent the culmination of all of my hopes and dreams, or does the coming of Jesus represent the end of the things that I love? Last week, we saw Christ's humility, last few weeks, and this week, we see the Father's exaltation of Christ because of his humility. This, this text tells us something about what's coming on that future day when Christ arrives, and it helps us answer several important questions. It, it points us to this future day when Christ is going to be finally and ultimately exalted. Here's, here's the main idea that I want us to think about this morning, the, the aim of humility. So, the humility we saw in, in Christ in verses 5 through 8 Now we see the aim. The aim of humility is to exalt the great name of Jesus Christ and glorify God the Father. What's the purpose of Christ's humility? What's the purpose of our humility? The aim of all humility is to exalt the name of Jesus Christ and glorify God the Father. Humility, in other words, precedes exaltation. Verses 5 through 8 take place before verses 9 through 11. Christ's act of humility takes place before the Father's act of exaltation. And we're going to look at three glorious things that follow and, and, and flow from the Son's humility. We're going to talk about the Son's exaltation. We're going to talk about, you don't have to write these down, we'll get to them. The, the Son's exaltation, the believer's worship, and the Father's glory. All these things come from Christ's act of humility. So let's, let's dive into the text here and, and keep your Bibles open because we're going to be looking at a lot of these, these verses this morning. The first thing we see here is the Son's exaltation. The Son's exaltation. Look at verse 9 with me. It begins, therefore. You say, okay, therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? Well, go back to verse 8. It's talking again about Christ's humility. It says, and being found, verse 8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, therefore. So because of Christ's obedient act of humility in coming as a servant, taking on flesh, living a perfect life, humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, because of that, something's happened. And what is the something that has happened? Well, there's two things 
that we see in verse 9, aren't there? Two things that God the Father does. The first thing we see that he did is he exalted the Son. Therefore, he says, God has highly exalted him. Not just exalted, there's a word in Greek for exalted, but Paul takes that word for exalted and he adds a prefix to it. It's the only time this word is used in the New Testament. He says he, he super exalted him. He, he highly exalted him, as the ESV translation says here. He exalted the Son. He exalted him beyond all other human beings. The Father takes Jesus in his divine and, and human natures, united in one person, and he exalts him. No other human being has been exalted as God exalts Jesus in his human nature. That's the first thing he does. And what's the second thing he does? He gives him something. He bestows on him a name, right? It says he exalted him and bestowed on him the name. What kind of a name? A name that is above every name. Now, what is that name? That's, that's the object of a lot of debate, but I, I think it's the name Lord, the, the divine name Yahweh. Look at verse 11. It says, every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is the Lord. That's, that's the same word that's used in the Old Testament translations in, in the Greek to describe Yahweh. So in other words, Jesus is the promised Davidic king. He's far greater than the Jews could have imagined the Davidic king being. Not only is he the son of David, but he's the son of God. And God the Father publicly proclaims this truth, that, that Jesus Christ is, is God, that he is Yahweh. He bestows on him a public recognition of his victory. As Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and, and says to his disciples, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So what's the first thing that flows from Christ's humility? It's his, his exaltation. The Father exalts the Son. Now, what's the, what's the application for you and me? Is it okay to worship a human being? A human being? Well, usually the answer is no. <laughs> but in one case... God has revealed to us that yes, not only is it appropriate to worship a human being, it's mandatory. We must worship Jesus Christ, who is fully human and will remain fully human for eternity. What does this mean for us? Well, it means we treat the name and the person of Jesus Christ as holy. We give him the same reverence as we do the Father and the Holy Spirit. You know, it's interesting, in Revelation 4, we, we see the Father being worshipped, and, and, and then we come to Revelation 5. You say, I knew we'd get to Revelation, we're going to talk about the future. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. In Revelation 5, something, something really important happens, and, and maybe, maybe you've missed it when you've read through Revelation 5, but in Revelation 5, the Lamb, God the Son, is being worshipped. And John calls it, as, as people sing this song to the Lamb, he calls it what? You know? A new song. A new song. And the, and the new song is being sung as this. Worthy are you, God the Son, the Lamb, to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your name you ransomed people for God from every tribe and, and, and language and people and nation. You've made them a kingdom of priests a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So Jesus' name, the Father has now declared that, that God the Son is, is to be worshipped. Now God the Son, the second member of the Trinity, was always to be worshipped, but now we understand the fullness of, of what it means to worship God the Son. He is the one who came, took on human flesh, lived as a human being, was a human being, and now we worship this human being as God, as Yahweh. So what do we do? <laughs> There's some things we don't do if we're going to worship him rightly. We don't demean his name. We don't take his name in vain. We're careful. 
We don't deny him in our actions or with our words. We grieve when others demean him. We treat his name as holy, right? I saw this last week. Maybe you saw this. Uh, Pope Francis met with 100 comedians at the Vatican. This isn't a joke. It sounds like the beginning of a joke. It's not a joke. <laughs> but he, he met with 100 comedians at the, at the Vatican, and, and maybe there was something lost in translation here, but the article that I read said that he told them it's okay to laugh at God. He says it's okay to laugh at God just like we play and joke with the people we love. Now, again, maybe something was lost in translation there, but I think it's okay to laugh with God, you know, as, as God points out the humor and, and ridicules things, and, you know, some holy sarcasm. But what do you laugh at God about? I mean, you and I laugh at each other. We, we kind of tease each other. My kids know that one of the great ways to kind of, if, if dad's being a hypocrite, not very helpful to come up to dad and say, hey, dad, just FYI, you're a hypocrite. It's really effective with me to kind of tease me about it. Hey, Dad, and kind of joke about me. Hey, you did this, and you said this, and you know, inconsistencies. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So humor with, with each other, it's, it's appropriate to laugh at each other. We, we do silly things, and a humble person is going to recognize, yeah, I really messed that up or made a mistake there. Um, the, the, the family jokes about how I, I can't walk up and down stairs. You know, I, I, I don't tease Joe Biden for that because I, I can't walk up and down stairs, right? <laughs> It's, it's funny, okay? I'm a human being, right? Uh, now, what, what do we understand about Jesus, though? There, there, there's nothing to, to ridicule about him. There's no weakness in Christ. His name is to be worshipped. It also means we, we, we do some things proactively. We're, we're worshipping on a, a Sunday morning carefully. How do we begin our service this morning? What, what, what song, at least, do we, we begin with? One of my favorite hymns, How Great Thou Art. And we, he talks about, the hymn talks about the creator God and, and the, then the miracle of the incarnation. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on my cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. You should have been overwhelmed with worship as we sung those words this morning, right? And, and then we went into the Apostles' Creed, a, a song based on Apostles' Creed that believers have been proclaiming for, for, for 2,000 years, the, these truths about Christ and the and triune God. We sing about Jesus Messiah, name above all names. We talk about Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. That, that's based at least partially here on Philippians chapter 2. We're going to end this morning by singing, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, gracious savior of my ruined life, my guilt and cross laid on your shoulders. In my place, you suffered, bled and died. You rose, the grave and death are conquered. You broke my bonds of sin and shame. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, may all my days bring glory to your name. Why is it appropriate to sing those words about a fellow human being? Because of the Son's exaltation by the Father, God has revealed to us, the triune God has revealed to us the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. And so it is not only appropriate for us to sing those words together this morning, we, we sing those words together by divine command and, and with joy, and, and we participate in the exaltation of the Son with, with the Father. And then we go home and forget about it. No, no, no. Then, then, then Sunday morning comes to an end, our time of worship, and then we live our, our lives the rest of the week also in awe of the glory of the name that God has exalted above all names, the name of Jesus Christ. And as we go into the, 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 the sporting events that we're a part of, we, through our faith that we've been united with Jesus Christ and we carry his name to the, the baseball team and, and the workplace and, and the home with our siblings and our, our parents. That's the son's exaltation. And there's a constant, constant awareness of the one who's in Christ. I continue by faith in the knowledge of who Jesus is and, and that I'm in him. Now, that's, that's the son's exaltation. Now let's look at the believer's worship. Look at verses 10 and 11. There's, there's several things 
that I want you to see here that, again, these are, these are things that are coming from Christ's humility. So Christ humbles himself. He's obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God's exalted him. And then there's, there's several things I want you to notice here. One, notice that there's a purpose to it. It says, so that. So God exalted him, and there was a purpose behind it. Secondly, notice that the purpose would be that the son would be recognized as, as Lord. So God exalts him. He gives him this name. Why? So that others would recognize him as Lord. Third, notice that the fullness of this recognition is in the future. It says that every knee should bow. Should bow. It's, it's future. It, it hasn't happened in its fullness yet. Fourth, Notice that the recognition is is universal. No one fails to acknowledge the lordship of Jesus Christ. There's there's parallel actions here. Either by will or by force, every knee in heaven, on earth, under the earth, that's every sentient being, every being that has the ability to, to, to think and to respond is going to someday respond by recognizing the lordship of Jesus Christ. Every every knee bows in submission. Every tongue confesses the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Angels in heaven, every person that's ever lived on the earth, every demon that has blasphemed the name of Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit will someday confess the lordship of Jesus Christ, willingly or unwillingly. You say, well, how do we know these? Does this mean everyone's a believer because they're acknowledging the lordship of Jesus Christ? No, sadly it does not. In fact, turn to Isaiah 45. And Paul, Paul is quoting Isaiah 45 here. And he's quoting Isaiah 45, verse 23. But let me give you a little bit of the context here. And as you turn there, I want you to notice how this passage helps us understand the passage that we're reading here in Philippians 2. Isaiah is talking about a time in the future. He's talking about a time in the future where God is going to be recognized as Lord and King. It's going to be by his enemies unwillingly and by his people joyfully. And by his people, we notice as we read this passage that he's going to be the one who saves his people so that they can worship him. We're going to see that his people is more than just Israel. And we're going to see that he saves through a human being, this coming Messiah. So look at verse 11. It says, thus says the Lord. That's, that's again, that word Lord, it's, it's the word Yahweh in Hebrew, the Holy One of Israel and the one who formed him. Ask of me the things to come. This verse, and it goes into verse 12. I've, I made the earth and created man. Then he says in verse 13, I have stirred him up in righteousness. He's talking about this coming Messiah. And I will make all his ways level and he shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Then verse 14 Thus says the Lord, thus says Yahweh, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. Some of them unwillingly, they shall come over in chains and bow down to you. So here, these are people who have not confessed the, the, uh, the lordship of, of God. They will plead with you saying, surely God is with you and there's no other, no God beside him. Then you go down to to verse 20. Assemble yourselves and come and draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge, those who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told you this? Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God besides me, a righteous God, And a Savior, there is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am am God and and there's no other. So there's this this universal declaration. All can can come and and worship me and and understand that I am the Lord and, and, and God and Yahweh. By myself, verse 23, I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. So this is, this is definitely going to happen. To me, 
Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord, only in Yahweh shall be said of me our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. Now, what does this mean? Only Yahweh can save like this. Only Yahweh can be worshipped like this. And what does Paul do? He tells us that this is pointing, that this is describing Jesus. Jesus, in the future, is going to be recognized as as Yahweh. Even by his enemies, again, unwilling, this doesn't mean that all all people are saved. We think about Revelation chapter 6 when the, the kings of the earth are going to to hide themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They're going to call out, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. So here are people who are experiencing God's wrath, who don't recognize him as Lord in faith, but still recognize and confess that he is the one who has authority over all. So he's recognized as Lord and King, even by his enemies, albeit unwillingly, and by his people, joyfully. There are people he has saved by his humble obedience, so that they can be saved. And worship, and it's more than just Israel. Let me just pause there and, and, and encourage you, uh, all uh, who are here this morning, you're someday going to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. But the Bible tells us t- today is the day of salvation. There's, there's a moment now in which you can turn from sin, from self-righteousness, and and by faith receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Confess now, calling on him for salvation. I would encourage you to do that, even today, trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, the perfect sacrifice who humbled himself, took on the form of a servant, lived a perfect life, humbled himself, and was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, and has now been exalted. Trust in him and worship him today. Let me give you some principles as we think about this reality, the the believer's worship. It's also the unbeliever's confession. But let me me give some principles to help you prepare for the end times. Uh, My kids uh, sometimes have talked to me about how to prepare for a zombie attack. Uh, some, sometimes I, I go to some of your houses and, and I, I kind of tease you. I, I see that uh, you have some nice property. And I say, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if the end ever goes down, I know, I know where to go. Okay? I, I, I'm not a prepper, but I don't make fun of preppers because you never know, uh, just in case. Uh, I just, you know, if, if, the end, if the end comes, I just need two things. I need enough gas to get to your house, and I need to work on my puppy dog eyes. Like, you know, me and my family, there's just a few of us. I do think it's wise to, to think about the future. I think it's wise to, to think about disasters that can strike. But there's one future event that we know for sure is coming. And that's the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is an event we must be prepared for. So here's a couple thoughts to help us prepare for the end times. Number one, let's remember this. The current age is the time of humiliation and suffering. That's that's the age we live in now. Humility, humiliation precedes exaltation in this passage and throughout Scripture, right? We are in the time of suffering. Paul puts it this way. He says, in Colossians 1.24, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. So Paul says, I'm suffering now for the church. He doesn't mean I'm suffering what's lacking in Christ's afflictions like Christ didn't do enough to save the church. He's saying, no, Christ's sufferings didn't end the age of suffering yet. There are still more afflictions for those who are in Christ to endure. Now is the age of humiliation and suffering. Whenever I was a, a little boy, sometimes I would stay with my grandparents in Arkansas and uh, during the summer. And, and there's nothing hotter that I've experienced than like an Arkansas summer. We would get up in the morning and my grandparents had a little 
little garden and because of property they'd work on. So we'd weed the garden and then we'd uh, work on the tractor. Or we'd kind of go through the woods and kind of clear some, some brush out or something. And uh, we'd, so we'd work all day there. I mean, it felt all day to a, you know, eight-year-old or whatever. And then, and then, and then this was the key. Uh, in the afternoon, Grandpa would say, okay, it's time to stop. Or Grandma says, it's time to stop. And then we'd go into the garage. And we'd open up the, the cupboard next to the sink. And there were all the, the colas you could imagine. And we'd, we'd usually grab out like a Pepsi. And then we'd go and we'd go into the kitchen and we'd grab one of those glass Coca-Cola, glass, you know, etched Coca-Cola on the side. And you'd, you'd, you'd take some ice and you'd fill the, the glass with the ice. And then you'd go out on the porch and psh, pop up, up the Pep- Pepsi and pour it in and sit down on the porch next to grandpa and, and drink your Pepsi. You know, it was just the most relaxed ever been. You never started the day with the Pepsi, right? This is what we ended the day with, right? Work preceded the Pepsi. We're not at the Pepsi stage yet, are we, right? This is the time of work. This is a time of preparation. This is a time of suffering. Now, as I think about application, the current age, the time of humiliation and suffering, a couple applications here. One, let's not minimize this time. Okay, sometimes we want to minimize suffering. It's, okay, you know, the future's coming, everything's going to be great. And yeah, it is, but let's not minimize the reality of suffering now. Romans 8.18 tells us the sufferings of this present age are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So yes, that glory is coming, and yes, it will be far greater than we can imagine, but let's not minimize the reality of our suffering now. And secondly, let's remember that, that suffering precedes glory. Our participation in future glory requires participation in present humility. So in other words, we can't skip this time of suffering. If you are in Christ, I don't mean requires in the sense of you have to earn God's grace, but if you're in Christ, we can't pretend like this, and, and we're going to be uni- and we're united with Christ through faith, and if we're truly in Christ, we can't deny the reality that this is a time of suffering. You can't skip over it. Here's the second principle to prepare for the end times. Number two, the current age is the time of hope and eager expectation. So what are we hoping for? What's the eager expectation of? Well, the, the revelation of the glory of Christ. This is a time of sanctification as we think about our hope. Here are a couple of signs that your eschatology, your, your thinking about the end times is off. If your eschatology, if you're thinking about the future, makes you worried and fretful, that's not a biblical eschatology. It's certainly not a biblical application of the truths of God's word. So if you're worried about the Russians, you're worried about Israel, you're worried about the, the, the state of America in the sense of, you know, we're, we're doomed, we're doomed, we're doomed. Okay, and you're living in a state of constant fear about the future, even small things, you're not doing eschatology right. Suffering brings exaltation. We're living in a time of, 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 of suffering, but a time of suffering with hope. First Peter, we see suffering and exaltation several times. So here, here's just a couple. First Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So right now, where are we? We're in the suffering time. The time of suffering for the believer is a time of, of confident expectation and hope of the glories to come. That's biblical eschatology. 1 Peter chapter 4, beloved, verse 12, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So what do we see there? Well, suffering precedes reward and, and glory, rejoicing. 
Paul describes our time now as a time of waiting to Titus. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, he says, We're waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the current age is a time of hope and expectation of the revelation of the glory of Jesus. We're looking forward to that day when what will happen The glory of Jesus will be revealed. Our knees will bow. Our tongues will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The current age is the time of hope and eager expectation. So if it makes you worried, if if your eschatology makes you worried, you're not doing it right. A second caution here as we think about this second principle. If your eschatology is putting hope in something besides Christ and the return of, of him and his glory you're not doing eschatology right there either. So sometimes I talk to believers and they're like, man, the country is really bad and the country is really tough and it's, it's horrible, but my hope is that I won't be here when it gets really bad. Okay. And Christ is going to take me and I, I won't have to deal with whatever's coming. Now, you, you have to be careful how you say that, right? Our hope, whatever you believe about the rapture, whether you believe the rapture is going to come seven years before Christ returns to set up his royal kingdom, or you believe it's going to be instantaneous, whatever, or three and a half years, or 3.65 years, whatever you believe about the, the rapture when Christ returns for his, for his church, our hope can't be, again, you have to be careful how you nuance this, it's not just in being removed from troubles, our hope is in the appearing of Christ. In other words, it's Christ-centered, not troubled-centered. Does that distinction make sense? So often people are thinking, well, you know, the the troubles, and I want to be removed from the troubles, but our hope has to be in the person of Jesus Christ. Scripture's focus is about Christ returning and setting all things right, about his glory being revealed. So this is an age of, of preparing our hearts to welcome Christ as king. This is an age, let me say it again, of us preparing to worship Jesus Christ as king, and our hope and our joy is in that. But you say, is it? (laughs) I know it's supposed to be. I know I'm supposed to look forward to to Christ's returning, and and for sure I'm excited about the removal of trouble. But Daniel, there's a part of my heart that's a Demas heart. There's a part of my, my heart that's a 2 Timothy 4, Demas, in love with this present world. What do I do about that? Let's look at the third principle to help us here. Number three, the coming age is the time of exaltation in Christ. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. There, there's, there's two things I want you to think about as you think about this principle. When Jesus comes, he's going to finish the work that he began in us. So, and this is the age of, of, of suffering. This is the age of, of hope and eager expectation. Our hearts are being sanctified as we go through hard things to cause us to yearn for Christ more. All that's taking place. But you say, okay, I've gone through suffering. I, I love Jesus more now than I did before. But still, the idea of Je- you know, if I saw Jesus right now, it wouldn't be total joy, I think. Part of me would be like, oh, no, I've got some things we've got to talk about. You say, what, 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 what does that mean? Am I a demon? Okay. The coming age is the time of exaltation Christ. And when he comes, he's going to finish the work that he's doing right now. Okay? <laughs> That's the good news. What do we see in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6? I'm sure of this, that he who began a, a good work in you will bring it to completion when? At the day of Christ Jesus. That's another reason for us to be excited about that day. You know, Jesus is our model for humility. But he's a model not in the sense only that he shows us what to do, but he's a model in the sense that he enables us to do it. Dads, we think about this on, on Father's Day, you know, where we try to be models for our children. Sometimes as my kids start doing things and, and they recognize that they're, they're doing things like I do them, there's a sense of, oh no, I'm, I'm like dad, you know, I'm doing this I'm taking notes like dad. I'm doing a checklist like dad. I'm using Excel spreadsheets like dad. I'm super cool like dad, whatever, you know. (laughs) There's a, oh. 
But my ability to influence my children it only goes so far, doesn't it? There, there's times when our kids are suffering and hurting, and we say, boy, if you just made a little bit of a different decision, life would be so much better. I wish I could help you get through this, but these are things you're going to have to do on your own. That's not the model that Christ provides. He's not just one who models. He's one who enables us to be who we are meant to be in him. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, what do we do? We await. It's coming. It's in the future. We await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is he going to do? Verse 21, he will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So Jesus Christ has been exalted over all, and he has the ability on the day that he returns for us to experience that day with fullness of joy. And so right now, as I think about my weakness in my, my lowly body, I'm looking forward because when the day that Jesus comes, he's going to finish the work that he's doing right now, and I will be able to experience the, the presence of Jesus with perfect joy because there's no longer these, these things that hold me back. Jude, verse 24, now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our God, our Savior, Jesus, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. That's worship. Our knees will bow with joy in the future, for there's no longer any part of our soul pulled in another direction. Our mouths will cry out, Jesus as Lord. And as we proclaim that in the future, there will be no doubt in our hearts. No doubt will linger. No sin will remain. No twinge of hypocrisy will condemn us. That's eschatology. That's our future. And when he comes, we'll behold his glory and enjoy it as only those who are in Christ may. Are you yearning this morning for that day? Here's what Piper writes in his book, Come Lord Jesus. He says, let yourself imagine just slightly what that hour will be like. We do not know with detail or precision what the moment of his coming will be like, but only with the slightest effort to imagine it, but only the slightest effort to imagine it overwhelms us. Suddenly, absolutely all doubt about his reality will vanish. Stark certainty will replace it. There will be nothing, absolutely nothing imaginary about it. It will be raw reality. For the first time in our lives, sight will replace belief in the unseen. The magnitude of it will be such as to make our hearts feel like exploding. And ourselves will have no capacities for the fathoming this event. It will stagger us. The third thing I want us to see here then is the Father's glory. And we're just going to touch on this for a minute here. The Father's glory. The third thing that takes place here is it's, it's to the glory of the Father, verse 11. He says, this is what God did. There in verse 9, this is the reason, verse 10, so that everyone would worship. And then, and every tongue, in the verse 11, every tongue confessed that Jesus is Lord. And then, to what ultimate end? To the glory of God the Father. That's always our aim. That's a reason for which we were created. The goal of our eschatology is the exaltation of the Son, but the goal of all of human life is the glory of the Father. The Son is exalted by the Father, and then what does he do in return? He gives all glory back to the Father. Are we Paul waiting for the, the blessed hope? Or, or are we Demas in love with the present world? Is our hope about the end times, about idols or the abolishment of idols, the aim of humility in this age is to exalt the great name of Jesus Christ and glorify God the Father. This is where all this is where all of our, our thinking about the future should land. The glory of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the triune God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this future day, this day where every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, this day where each knee will bow as we worship the Son to the glory of the Father. We cannot understand that future today. 
our hearts recoil in unbelief, even as we think about beholding your glory. We pray that you would confirm your love for us this morning, that in each heart that is trusting your son Jesus, there would be a a confident expectation that you will do what you have promised to do. You allow us to experience the joyness of relationship with you fully. We pray that it would produce humility in our hearts today as we await our future exaltation in your son Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.